Hi everyone, and today we're going to be looking at the final definition of abnormality, and that is deviation from ideal mental health. So you're going to look at six criteria today of mental health and how these are used to define abnormality. And then we're going to evaluate this looking at the strengths and the weaknesses. And then maybe you could think about at the end how you could compare the definitions to decide which is the best definition of abnormality. So you might want to think about creating a list of six criteria that you think people should meet if they are mentally healthy. And how could we use this to create a definition of abnormality? Well, how would this definition be different from the others and the other three definitions? So pause the video and have a think of six criteria that you could come up with. So before we look at the six criteria that Jehoda created, we're just going to have a little look at what she said. So Jehoda said that this definition looks at the positives rather than the negatives. So it's about being having a positive mental health state rather than looking at at it as mental illness and she identified six major criteria for optimal living and this she believed that this promoted well-being and the individual to feel happy so that they can behave and react normally within society and she claimed that anyone lacking any of these qualities would be vulnerable to a mental health disorder so not necessarily that they would have a mental health disorder but that they could be vulnerable to it and therefore they would be classed as abnormal. And the more criteria that you fail to meet, the further you are from being considered normal. So the following criteria are Jehoda's, and she said that you would need self attitudes, personal growth and self actualization integration, autonomy, having an accurate perception of reality and mastery of the environment. Have a think about what these mean before I go through them on the next slide. So the first one is self attitudes and this is having high self esteem and a strong sense of your identity so you know where you fit in the world. The second one is personal growth and this look and self actualization and this is the extent to which an individual develops to their full capacities. Now some of you might have heard of self actualization in relation to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's at the top of Maslow's hierarchy and self actualization is seen as achieving the goals that you want to achieve within life. So that might be getting your dream job in a, um, a your dream job, or it might be um, uh, buying a house somewhere where you've always wanted to live. The third one is integration. Now this one is being able to cope with stressful situations. Although we all might find things stressful sometimes, we should have the ability and the resilience to cope with a situation. Autonomy. This is being independent and self-regulating. This is something that we might have heard about in education and being a self-regulated learner. So someone who's able to work out and solve problems on their own and cope with being on their own. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are completely independent of everyone else. But if you were left to your own devices, you would be OK to do so. The next one is accurate perception of reality. So this is just simply having an understanding of how the world behaves and you having an accurate perception of that. Mastery of the environment is including the ability to love in terms of a romantic relationship or just loving your family. It's the ability to function at work and school and the ability to hold relationships and adjust to new situations that come and not struggle to do so. So if we're thinking about evaluating the definition, you might want to think about how the strengths and weaknesses of it in comparison to the other previous three definitions that we thought about. So you might think of some of the following. We know that most of these criteria are specific to Western culture. For example, self-actualization is all about you achieving your own potential. 
And therefore, that is very specific to Western cultures, because in Western culture, it's about being independent and about focusing on yourself, achieving your best. Whereas in Eastern cultures, it's more about achieving the best for your family. So this re piece of research is very culturally biased. It might only apply to Western cultures. And then again, that means that people could be diagnosed differently with a mental health issue in one culture and not in another culture. Additionally, according to these criteria, most of us are abnormal. For example, we don't all experience personal growth all the time. We're not always achieving. We're not always reaching our full potential. And therefore, we could be seen as abnormal. And so is this criteria really useful to us? Also, on top of that, she's very unspecific about the number of criteria that you need to be considered abnormal. So further clarification is needed in order to us to fully utilise this definition in an actual medical situation. Third, perceptions of reality change over time. So an example here is that we used to accept that seeing visions of God was a sign of a religious commitment, but now it's more likely that you're going to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or something similar. And therefore, that means that the study lack, the theory sorry, lacks temporal validity because over time, our values and beliefs change. And therefore, these criteria might not be suitable in 30 years time. However, the definition is comprehensive. It's well detailed and it covers a broad range of criteria. And this means that the definition has practical applications in treatment, because if we ask people to focus on the positive criteria rather than the negative aspects of their behaviour, this may help them to recover. Hopefully that was helpful.